we're going to talk about some surgical problems of the larynx here. We'll talk about the laryngocele uh, and then some uh, growths that you can get in the larynx, particularly uh, growths that you can get on the vocal cords. So just a very brief anatomy recap. Uh, looking at the external of the larynx, you have the hyoid bone, which sits roughly at the level of the epiglottis. The epiglottis serves the very important function of blocking the respiratory tract from the uh, laryngopharynx when you're eating and drinking, you want to make sure that goes down your esophagus, not down the wrong tube. And we've all ate or drank and it, quote unquote, went down the wrong tube. And we start coughing and choking. And that's because we swallowed before the epiglottis was properly in place. And so the epiglottis covers the laryngeal out or inlet and that allows food and drink to go into the esophagus rather than into the uh, respiratory tract. You have a hyoid bone that sits here, sort of like this horseshoe shaped bone. Uh, in, then you have this very prominent cartilage. This is the thyroid cartilage. It has this uh, characteristic notch here and this makes up your Adam's apple. Uh, the thyroid cartilage is separated from the hyoid bone by the thyrohyo thy thyrohyoid membrane. Beneath the thyroid cartilage is the cricoid cartilage, which is a signet ring shaped uh, cartilage. And if you consider the cricoid cartilage the top part of the trachea, it is the only uh, circular, consistent, complete ring around the respiratory tract. The tracheal cartilages are all incomplete. In between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage is a very important cricothyroid cartilage, or cricoth oh, sorry, no, that's not right, cricothyroid membrane. Uh, this cricothyroid membrane is important because this is where you pierce when you do a cricothyroidotomy. So this is an important landmark to know here for that purpose. So if you do an incision down the midline and pull it out from either side like a book, you'll see the epiglottis here, and then the middle part of your larynx uh, consists of your false vocal cords and your true vocal cords. The false vocal cords sit superiorly, the true vocal cords are inferior, and in between those are a ventricle, and this ventricle is just this invagination laterally uh, from the larynx. The vocal cords are powered by muscles, uh, including the vocalis muscle, but there's other muscles that also uh, are involved. And then downward from there, you go into the trachea. Oh, also important to remember, all of this here is covered by a squamous cell epithelium. And so anywhere along the larynx, you are at risk for developing squamous cell cancer. And so I talk about head and neck squamous cell cancer. The larynx is one of the possible places where you can get head and neck squamous cell cancer. And when we consider masses on the vocal cords or around the vocal cords, we always have to keep in mind squamous cell cancer because that is always a possibility. The laryngocele is a dilation of the laryngeal saccule. What is the laryngeal saccule? It's just part of the, laryngeal, the laryngeal ventricle. And the ventricle is this invagination here. The saccule is like a little appendix on it. It goes up superiorly. So that's your saccule. And that can become dilated. And when it becomes dilated, it can press on other structures. So what puts you at risk for laryngocele, anything that increases interlaryngeal pressure. So valsalva, coughing, straining, glass blowing, shouting, wind instruments, and so forth. If the laryngocele becomes blocked, then mucus can accumulate in the laryngocele, and that's what we call a laryngomucocele. If it's blocked and it then becomes infected and, and bacteria colonize and it becomes inflamed, then it's a laryngopiocele. So the symptoms of laryngocele we're going to see depend on which direction the laryngeal uh, or the laryngocele goes. Uh, but the symptoms consistently tend to be strider and a change in voice because you're monkeying around the, uh, the vocal cords. So typically there's some kind of change in voice. However, 
there's two possible routes for this sack to go. So it could go internally. So the sack could go medially. And if it goes medially, it's going to push the false vocal cords medially. And that's going to cause a, uh, to some degree, an obstruction of the uh, airway. And so the laryngocele remains in the laryngeal cavity, but it causes bulging of the false fold and the area epiglottic fold. And that can block the uh, that can block the rest of the larynx from the trachea, and so it can interfere with breathing. So here's an example of an internal laryngocele. So here's your uh, so here's your laryngocele here, and so it's pushing up against the false vocal cords. Here's your true vocal cords down here, and your false vocal cords up here, and it's pushing. That pressure is pushing up against as it dilates. It's pushing up against the false vocal cords, pushing it medially and obstructing the airway. Now, on the other hand, you can also get a uh, an external laryngocele. And with the external laryngocele, what happens is that the laryngocele will protrude up and over the thyroid cartilage, and it will create a neck mass. So here's your thyroid cartilage. It comes up and over, and then it pushes up against the soft tissue of the neck, and that creates a visible neck mass. So while that won't create difficulty breathing because it's not interfering with the lumen of the larynx, it will create this neck mass. Okay, and then also just to add, if it is an infected laryngocele, you can get fever and all those symptoms uh, associated with infection. So for diagnosis, it's going to depend on how the patient presents. I mean, usually number one on your differential, even if you have a neck mass, is not laryngocele. Uh, so various tests may be done. However, if you really do suspect laryngocele, if it's number one on your differential, CT is technically the best initial diagnostic test. However, you may be getting radiographs or ultrasounds in the interim, and those will show cystic air spaces in the larynx. Uh, for treatment, laryngoceles will require surgical excision. Uh, if they're infected, it's going to require incision and drainage, surgical excision, and, and then broad-spectrum antibiotics uh, to uh, manage the infection. The external laryngoceal will often press up against the neck, and so you'll note the neck mass. The internal laryngoceal, a lot of times uh, you may uh, suspect this based on when you intubate the patient, you note uh, abnormal anatomy. You've got uh, the false folds protruding medially. But really, CT is going to be your best way to diagnose this. Okay, so here's your larynx. And this would be like when you're talking. So the uh, these are your true vocal cords. They're kind of a little bit whiter in color. And then your false vocal cords up here. Uh, and when they're together, it creates a vibration of air coming up through your lungs and out your mouth, and that's what allows you to talk. When they're apart, this V shape here, that's when you're breathing. And so you allow air to get in through uh, to, to the lungs. Okay, I don't think I have anything else to talk about there. Okay, so uh, I'll also ana uh, uh, just anatomically orient you. Uh, this would be anterior down here where the at the bottom of this V shape and then this is posterior back here at the top of your screen. Okay, so vocal nodules. So you saw it right here. These are vocal nodules and uh, vocal nodules are benign bilateral masses that occur towards the anterior part of the true vocal folds and these are associated with vocal abuse. So when we say vocal abuse, typically we're talking about somebody who uses their voice too often. So perhaps a singer, uh, an opera singer who may be uh, singing a little too much, somebody who's giving more speeches than they normally do, it's like a politician or somebody, someone who's screaming often, uh, especially if they're making a really high pitch, any of this stuff would be considered vocal abuse. So when I say vocal abuse, that's what I mean here. The symptoms of vocal nodules, you can imagine, 
are uh, going to be associated with the fact that you can't get your uh, you, you can't get your vocal folds adducted properly because you have masses on your vocal folds. So if it, if you have a mass in the way, you're going to be more like this and less like this. This is no masses here. If you have a mass getting in the way, then you're going to have extra space coming out when you're trying to talk, and that's going to reduce the vibration. You're going to sound kind of breathy when you talk. So uh, the symptoms are these voice changes, this typical breathy uh, voice sound, almost like you're whispering. And uh, some people describe it as hoarseness. Um, some patients, if it's large enough, they can uh, perceive a mass in their throat. They may have ear pain. Uh, and it's going to take increased effort to produce the desired sounds because, think about it, again, you have masses on your vocal cords and you want to shut these vocal cords appropriately, uh, adduct the vocal cords appropriately. And if there's a mass, you're going to need, need to use more muscle tone to close that vocal, those vocal folds appropriately. And so it's going to take more effort to produce the desired vocal sounds. For diagnosis, we do a laryngoscopy, and the laryngoscopy will visualize the mass. And we want to be ready to do a biopsy because anytime you have a mass in the larynx, we want to biopsy it to make sure that it's not squamous cell carcinoma. For treatment, this generally resolves on its own with voice therapy and rest. And uh, typically, these resolve on their own. And this stands in contrast to the vocal polyps and the vocal granulomas, the laryngeal granulomas which do not resolve on their own. Those will require surgery. Okay, so here's vocal nodules again here. Pretty uh, inconspicuous. You see though that they're bilateral, and that's, a, that's a, a, a trait for vocal nodules that you don't see with the polyps and the granulomas. Again, bilateral, and they're due to vocal abuse. Okay, that's a laryngeal granuloma. I don't know why I put it there. Okay, here's a vocal nodule. It's not, this was diagnosed as a vocal nodule. It's not perfectly bi bilateral, but you can see here that there is a nodule right here that's refracting some of the light, but there's larger nodules right here. Okay, vocal polyps. So these, unlike nodules, tend to be unilateral but they're also benign masses and they also occur on the true vocal cord. They are larger than nodules and they also tend to have a prominent vessel which can be visualized on laryngoscopy. That's how you diagnose it. So these are associated with vocal abuse, but they tend to also be associated with other things. They can be associated with acute trauma. And when we're talking acute trauma, we're usually talking about things we do. So uh, intubating a patient or doing a laryngoscopy or a bronchoscopy. If you hit the vocal cord too hard, you can cause trauma, and that trauma can result in a polyp or a granuloma. Reflux disease, chronic coughing, hypothyroidism, chronic allergies, chronic inhalation of tobacco smoke, environmental exposure to various fumes, etc. So the nodules are almost always caused by vocal abuse, whereas vocal polyps they can be caused by vocal abuse, but they also have other causes, medical causes. The symptoms are similar to vocal nodules, and it all goes back to the fact that you can't get those vocal cords shut properly uh, to create sound. And so you're going to have a change in voice quality and possibly a perceived foreign body because you do have a mass down there. For diagnosis, we do laryngoscopy with biopsy. Treatment is surgical excision. Unlike vocal nodules, the smaller and bilateral vocal nodules, the larger vocal polyps do not have a tendency to regress on their own, so we do surgical excision. We will also want to treat any of the possible medical problems that are behind this, so if they have reflux disease, we want to treat that because that's an underlying factor, uh, possible underlying factor. If they have chronic coughing or hypothyroidism, we want to treat that too. But for vocal polyps, we do surgical excision. So here's a vocal polyp. It's unilateral. And you can also kind of see the vessels on this too. So here's another vocal polyp. 
And another one. And here it looks like there was some acute irritation to the vocal cords. See how it's red here? Or that could be blood spilling out. These can bleed a little bit. Not enough to cause any significant problems, though. So here's a really good uh, view of a vocal polyp where you can see that vessel on it. A laryngeal granuloma is similar to a vocal polyp in that it's a response to repeat trauma to the vocal cords, uh, but this is different in that this is an elaborate uh, uh, healing response and this can also occur elsewhere in the larynx, not just on the vocal cord. Typically it's caused by trauma, like instrumentation. Uh, if you, you're uh, tracheing somebody, if you're doing laryngoscopy or bronchoscopy, all of that can do it. Reflux disease, vocal abuse, post-nasal drip, chronic throat clearing, similar to what the causes are behind the vocal polyps. The symptoms are also similar. Change in voice quality, cough, throat clearing uh, due to foreign body sensation, etc. Diagnosis, laryngoscopy with biopsy. What's going to differentiate the laryngeal granuloma is, well, first off, you need to get a biopsy. That's going to help you. But the laryngeal granuloma can occur anywhere in the larynx, not just the vocal cords. And also, they have a tendency to occur more posteriorly, whereas the nodules and the polyps occur more anteriorly. The laryngeal granulomas have a tendency to occur more posteriorly. The treatment for laryngeal granuloma is first medical therapy to ameliorate any of the possible underlying causes, so GERD, uh, post-nasal drip due to allergies, and so forth. Usually they regress. If surgical resection, uh, if medical therapy has not worked, if it hasn't regressed and the symptoms have not improved, then surgical resection will be indicated. Uh, and then, uh, and also, Surgical resections indicate that the granuloma is causing airway problems. That's probably obvious, though. So here's a laryngeal granuloma. You can see it's on the posterior part of this left vocal cord here. It's another one. And another one. Okay, so let's just review polyps versus nodules versus granulomas. So nodules tend to be caused by vocal trauma. They tend to be bilateral and anterior, and we diagnose it with laryngoscopy and biopsy. Vocal trauma, vocal abuse, it's the same thing. Um, we tend to diagnose this with laryngoscopy and biopsy uh, to exclude malignant possibility and confirm diagnosis. Uh, we will treat this with voice training, and if it doesn't regress, then surgical excision. Laryngeal granulomas, we do, uh, this can be caused by endotracheal intubation, it can be caused by reflux disease, chronic coughing, or vocal abuse. Uh, it can be unilateral or bilateral, but it tends to occur in the posterior part of the larynx or the posterior vocal cord. These are larger than the nodules. The nodules are the smallest of these three. Again here, we do laryngoscopy and biopsy, and we start with medical uh, therapy, going after any kind of underlying cause, and then surgical excision if that doesn't work. With the vocal polyps, they tend to be caused by acute trauma, reflux disease, coughing, inhalation of fumes, hypothyroidism, uh, or the typical vocal trauma. These, unlike the vocal nodules, tend to be unilateral and often feature that vessel, and these are also larger than nodules. We do laryngoscopy with biopsy to exclude any malignant uh, possibility and to confirm the diagnosis. These will require surgical excision. So if you take anything from this, remember that nodules are the smallest. They tend to be bilateral. Polyps and granulomas are larger. Polyps tend to be more anterior. Granulomas tend to be more posterior. But the nodules and the granulomas, we, we approach with medical therapy. Polyps go straight to surgical excision. And also remember this, that it's an absolute indication for surgical removal if whatever the mass is, is compromising the airway 
or if the biopsy comes back and it's identified as a fibroepithelial polyp. That's a polyp that's not going to regress and that needs to be uh, removed immediately. Okay, the laryngeal papilloma is a mass that's caused by a virus, the human papilloma virus, and this is the most common laryngeal tumor, although it is rare overall, and it can occur at any age. Even though this is caused by HPV 6 or 11, it is not an STD. It can be transmitted uh, from the mother to the baby during vaginal delivery if the mother happens to be infected with this HPV strain. The symptom is similar to what you see with the nodules, the polyps, the granulomas, because this is a mass on the larynx or on the vocal cords. And so it can progress from a hoarseness, a strider, change in voice, to uh, the symptoms that are more associated with a, a compromised airway like strider and obstruction. And usually this is going to be a gradual progression because this is a virus and this is uh, accumulating over time. For diagnosis, we do laryngoscopy. You may also want to do a bronchoscopy here because the papilloma can actually extend into the upper airways. However, the most accurate test is a biopsy. It's only through biopsy that you'll be able to for sure know that this is HPV because you'll be able to stain for that virus. The treatment is surgical resection and that can be accomplished either by laser or by traditional cold knife resection. Unfortunately for a lot of these patients, this is a recurrent disease, and so they're going to be in and out of the OR often. We do have a drug that is used for patients who have recurrent cases. It's called cydofavir, and this reduces the recurrence but doesn't completely eliminate them. So here's a laryngeal papilloma. There's nothing, just looking at it, unless you're an ENT and you know more than I do, there's nothing just looking at it that tells you necessarily that this isn't a polyp. I mean, there's two of them, but, you know, you got you got to do the biopsy to know for sure. Again, this one could be a polyp, but we don't know. Usually with papillomas, you'll see large and small lesions, whereas polyps, you'll see just a large lesion. Nodules, you'll just see small lesions. So this is laryngeal papilloma. Again here you can see extensive tumors on the vocal cord. But this can occur anywhere in the larynx or even in the upper respiratory tract. So kind of just going back over some of these things we talked about, these are normal vocal cords. This would be in the position when you're uh, breathing. Polyps uh, tend to be unilateral, larger, Nodules tend to be bilateral and smaller. Uh, we don't see the granuloma here, but they tend to look like the polyps, and they tend to be more posterior, so away from the, uh, the little V point here, the posterior side. Uh, cancer can look similar to any of this, and that's why we're biopsying it, and they produce similar symptoms. Remember, the cancer we're mostly concerned with is squamous cell carcinoma. And then one-sided paralysis, we didn't really talk about this, but what can paralyze the vocal cord? Any injury to the vagus or recurrent laryngeal nerve, and that can come from cancers, from surgeries. Particular cancers would be like thyroid cancers, lung cancer, brain cancer, uh, especially at the, bra at the base. Uh, and then uh, esophageal cancers can uh, compromise the recurrent laryngeal nerve as well. And then any kind of blunt trauma to the neck can cause one-sided paralysis as well because of nerve injuries. Too bad it's not this easy when you look inside patient's vocal cords. So here's the larynx. This is an old Gray's Anatomy drawing. In the spirit of Halloween, I thought this looked kind of funny. Kind of looks like a, I don't know, an alien devil something. I don't know. But anyhow, happy Halloween.